everyone, and welcome back to the Leap Before You Look podcast. We are mastering the art of overthinking, getting out of our head and into our happy. On today's episode, I have a special guest, um, King Ruler, who King Ruler, who is originally from South Central Los Angeles. Um, and today we're going to be talking about healing from PTHD. So, if you would do the honor of introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about your story, so we can get to the episode. Okay. Again, my name is King Ruler. I got the King Ruler from my graffiti days back in the days. I used to write graffiti. So that was my name. Okay. I just added the King to it. But um, I grew up again, yes, in South Central LA in the heart of the gang violence and the crack epidemic in LA. I was a, a young boy or a teenager in those in that era. Um, grew up around a bunch of endangered species young brothers like myself that a lot of them didn't make it out um there was a lot of chaos going on in those days i um me personally i gravitated to hip-hop and sports to kind of get away from it um to kind of like numb numb the situation around me but it came back to me later on in life that i didn't get away from it (laughs) Mm. It, 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 I, I thought I did, but I didn't. Um, it was still a part of my, my genetic makeup when I left and, you know, became an adult, had children, got married, all that stuff. It started coming to the surface with things that were really pretty much considered a, a normality where we mm-hmm. come, where I come from. Um, but after two divorces, it made sense that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a normal thing, right? Um, a lot of people like to say, you know, um, couples argue. I'll give you that example. Couples argue. I was like, at first I believed that. But after I came out of that, I said, no, you don't. P- couples communicate. People choose to argue. So when you come from a hostile environment where arguments are normal, nor- it's a normal reaction to things like you tend to embody those things. And that's what I had to come to realize after coming out of the neighborhood and actually sitting in a few therapy sessions, trying to just see who I am. And when I got a chance to speak my story to this therapist, it was just like, this is not normal. (laughs) I even started thinking like, this is not normal. Like people don't live like this everywhere I've been. Why is this normal for our experience in this demographic called the hood? So, I started a journey with that. Um, I be, I got initiated as a African spirituality priest about four or five years ago. And doing that work, it brought up some more things for me. I got divorced for the second time. And then I had to just kind of sit with myself. And I really began to see me in the picture, my good, bad, and ugly. And I just decided to deal with it. But I know a lot of the ugly was the post-traumatic hood disorders that I was carrying in majority of my life. So here I am. Okay. So I'm going to ask, what made you take the leap to do th- to go to therapy? Because I know in our community, it's not like I'm, a, I'm a therapy and I started my therapy. I started therapy about a year ago mm-hmm. and like, I'm from the South side of Chicago. So I understand the, the, um, the chaos. And I was just talking about this, like, how it's normal. Mm-hmm. Like you having a, a sense of peace is not as normal. It was a struggle for me to allow myself to just sit in peace. Mm-hmm. So what's something that, what what was the thing that made you say, okay, I need to, I need to go to therapy. I can't really put it on one particular thing. I was just tired of the up and down and the, I always felt angry and I didn't know why. Right. Um, as a child, I was not, angry. I was kind of, I'm a Pisces, so I was kind of like easygoing, joking here and there, but there were some pivotal moments as a child that sent me off the edge and I became angry. And I was tired of that anger being a part of my, being a part of me, I guess. And that anger kind of like destroyed a lot of things in the process. So I would like gain stuff and then I would do something crazy out of anger and it would just kill it all. I would get in a relationship and my anger would kill it. Not like no violently abusive stuff, but just not knowing how to manage my emotions as a man, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't know how to manage that. 
I thought being tough was managing my emotions and it wasn't. So that toughness allowed me to be, made me rigid and that rigidness pushed people away. So, um, it was a few different scenarios, but it was me just basically being tired of the up and the down, the roller coaster. And one day it was a, it was a, um, therapy spot across the street from my barbershop that I go, went to all the time. I said, I'm going to go in there and just check them out. And I sat with this lady one time and I wound up going for like three months until I got it all out. And then I stopped. Okay. Did you, so when you started um, your healing journey, healing for PTHD, did you have any pushback? Like, did you tell anybody? Like, Cause I've, I shared, like, I want to go to therapy and I got pushback. Like, oh, you crazy. Just send the third. Did you, did you have any pushback when it comes to, when it came to like you trying to heal and, and work on yourself? I didn't really tell anybody. I kind of kept it to myself. Um, mm. You know, as a man, we don't really have those spaces, <laughs> especially back then, right? I'm talking like 15, yeah. 15, almost 20 years ago. Like, we didn't have those spaces. Like, you saying I want to go to therapy was a sign of weakness in our community. So it was like, it was weird. So I had to keep it to myself that I was actually doing it. I would get my hair cut and then go right across the street. Nobody knew where I was going. And then going to the therapy session and going about, about my life afterwards. I didn't tell anybody really. Okay. That makes sense. <laughs> I know a friend of mine, he's, I was like trying to encourage him to go to therapy because I'm a big advocate for it, especially men, especially black men going to um, go to therapy for me in my journey. So that's all I asked. But then I, yeah, back then it was probably not a, really a safe space for, um, or even now actually for you all to have to express um, the desire to get therapy and get help. Mm-hmm. And you said you, you said you, you said you mentioned African studies. Mm-hmm. Can you elaborate on that? Like what you've learned and how you connect that to how we, how our community, when it comes to us having these norm, these normalized, um, this normalized hood disorder, how does that play a part or how does, how does it help you kind of disconnect from it even further? That's probably a better question. Um, I study a Nigerian spiritual practice and during that practice, I learned some stuff. They call it the Ori. I'm actually an Ori coach, right? But they call it the Ori and there's in, within the concept of Ori, I learned that there's three components that make us tick. Our logical mind, the mind, our emotions, which is basically our gut. So when people say I'm going with my gut feeling you're pretty much going with your emotion our emotions our gut and then our feet the way we move the way we show up in in the world the main battle goes on between your head and your gut which dictates where your feet go so when you have trauma like i had to experience trauma naturally neutralizes and shuts down logic and you pretty much respond primarily emotion wise that's where i found myself at so when i figured that part out i was like oh this is why i've been angry because anger is an emotion anger can come and it will leave it's not going to stay it's just something that's making you feel a certain way that's causing the anger the problem was get to the root why do you feel that way that way logic can come back into the room and you can make a better decision all right I had to get to that point and doing the studies of that, it taught me that concept. And that's when I kind of like began to like piece it all back together. Okay. That came from this. I'm angry about this particular thing in a relationship because something happened with my mother that taught me that I can't trust women for a reason. So she's doing something similar to that. So I'm going to get angry at it and I'm going to let it control my emotions. No, we're not doing that no more. So you can go back to logic and then make a logical decision and say, hey, she's not your mom. She don't owe you that. What's the lesson she's trying to teach you, though? You see what I'm saying? Like it's yeah. that, that rabbit, upward rabbit hole to figure out how do I get out this hole and get back into the sunlight? And that's how I figured it out through that process of teaching and understanding that. That's interesting because I'm I'm kind of trying to take that approach. My therapist told me I don't connect stuff to, not to make it about me. 
I'm, I'm not trying to. <laughs> but my therapist, you talk, you used to talk about emotions. I'm like, I would say something, and my therapist is like, you never connected with the emotion. And I'm like, I, I didn't realize that until she told me. Like, I'll say something that's going on. She's like, how did that make you feel? And that's something that she's trying to. I'm trying to do more is connect to understand like what, how it makes me feel versus bad versus good. Like I was telling my friend last night, I don't like these feelings of being elevated, like arguing. Mm -hmm. I don't like that because it's draining. It's negative. I'm like, I can have a conversation and just be calm and we have a disagreement, but I don't have to yell at you. That part. And I found myself, I had an argument recently, but I was like, I don't like that. I don't want to go back to that, that place. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, that's, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> um, so when it comes to like, do you, do you have like, um, your, you said you're a coach. Right? Ori coach. Yeah. Ori coach. Do you have, um, do you help youths like young men, young women? Help, how do you how do you find that that helps them in their um, development? It helps them a lot. I mean, I pretty much focus on the PTHD aspects of it because it's, mm -hmm. it's my background. I can't teach something I don't know really, right? right? I can't go to the suburbs and teach people why they're mad in the suburbs. You have everything I never had. I, don't, I can't really teach that. <laughs> but, um, I kind of focus on the PTHD aspects of it and a lot of young men and girls but primarily I get young men that I, I tell them all the time, like if you want to see a gangster, a thug, the toughest guy in the neighborhood, he's just a broken dude. that don't know how to say, ouch. Period. Yeah. Like everybody that I know that I grew up with from elementary school, they were all cool kids until we got in junior high and they became thugs. <laughs> right. But before we was just throwing, riding dirt bikes and having fun and laughing. But now you became a thug. Why? Because when you got to this certain age, you got traumatized because somebody kept trying to jack you for your money or your lunch money or, or try to punk you or try to fight you because you see what gang you're from a hood. And that's traumatizing. So I get a lot of those kids that I tell, like, you don't have to put on the face no more. Like this face is not real, but the, the, the hood is not real. The hood is a make believe situation, period. It's not a real situation. Mm -hmm. It's made up by some other construct that has you in this video game that you believe exists and is real, but it's not. It's only an experience. And you're only there to learn from the experience so that you can make your life better. That's it. But to internalize it and let it become you, that will derail your purpose. So that's what I kind of get from a lot of the young men because, you know, they, they want to play tough. They have to play tough. I know how it is because I have to do it myself. You got to play tough. If you're not going to play tough, you will get rolled over in those environments. But what happens when you come out of it? What happens when you decide to go to college? You can't take that to, to the campus. You know what I mean? You can't, mm -hmm. if you're a sports person, you can't take that to your team. You will be kicked out and booted out of school. Like You just can't take that. Everywhere. We can't take that into a marriage and have a functional real marriage. You just can't. Yeah, it's, it's the facade that they're wearing. And I try to help them to see that. Just because you live in that environment, you don't have to become it. Overcome it and find the, the reason why you were born into that environment, because that environment was made for you to bring something out of you. That you needed to see it's going to bring something out of you. What that is, that's probably yet to be seen, but it's there. You got to look for that and not try to be like them. Okay. Do you see, do you think that social media plays into that now? Because it's more like you have, you know, you, you have access to a lot of different things. Do you feel like with, with the, the, the youth that you teach and that you coach, do you feel like they, that can um, add to that PTHD, seeing it constantly, like on social media and stuff like that? Social media, music, it's all a part of the programming. It's all a part of that. Because again, going back to the to the Ori concept, like the logical part of your of your Ori is the is the is the mind. The mind is the place where every sensory is processed. So whatever you see, your eyes see is processing it. It has to do something with it. 
either you're going to use it or it's going to store it for something later on. Anything you smell, anything you hear, anything is, is going, is processed through the mind. So by looking at social media so much, the messages that you see on, I don't care what it is, if it's Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, whatever, whatever you pay attention to the most and you see the most, it's going to come back out of you some kind of way. If you don't process it properly. How do you do that? Well, first of all, why are you watching Basketball Wives? I don't know. Why are you watching the ghetto show? I don't know. Like, what, 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 what draws you to that? I think there's something in you that's that you're scarred from that is magnetic to you. Nobody. I feel like you just called me out. Huh? <laughs> I feel like you just called me out. <laughs> or you watch Basketball Wives? You do. I, you know what? I used to. I was just like, at some point, I was like, I cannot tell. Why am I watching people yelling at each other? This is, this is stupid. Why am I watching But, but look what you said. You don't like yelling and arguing, right? That's all they do on those shows. That's it. There's no show without an argument on that, on that show. So, again, why are we drawn to that? Because what we've seen. And if we've seen it, again, your mind has to process it. So when you see it again, it's like, oh, there it goes. Let's go there. We've seen this before. But you're supposed to make a logical decision. Now your logic is gone, so now you're making the emotional decision to go towards it, knowing that it's not for you. Because that's not there's no logic in that. Right? Mm -hmm. So logic has left the room. It's just your emotional scar tissue that's drawing you to it. It's kind of like when you break a bone and it heals, it gets cold, and you feel the ache. Like it's letting you know that, yeah, you did break that bone, it's still there. Right? That's what that that's what that emotion is. If, if you see that, that TV show or you see that video, you see that rapper, you see this and you, oh, I've seen that. I know G thing. I, I've seen Dr. Dre before. That's, that's my cousin. I, remember, I like that song. Not knowing that that was not normal just because you've seen it. That's crazy. Yeah, that's that. Oh, we make so much stuff normal. That and then and it's really interesting. I was thinking, I don't know if I was talking to my sister the other day about how people, the violence, like we are now we're recording stuff live. People getting killed yeah. or getting beat up, and it's now it's it's so normal now. And it's just like why there's a disconnect to allow that to become something that's just an everyday thing, and. To the point where school violence is normalized, where they're making drills. They're, I got a message from my son's school saying that they, you know, they had a, a drill for like an intruder. And I'm like, but this shouldn't. I mean, when I was younger, we just had tornado and earthquake drills. And I was in Chicago, we didn't mm -hmm. have none of that. So it's just like my sister works in an elementary school and she was freaking out because her son goes to the school. And she's like, how do I go get my son? And Make sure we both say. And, and my son work it's his school's right down the street from her. So it's just like a lot of stuff that should not be normal is now the new norm. Yeah, it's a whole nother question now. Said. They're getting they're getting things that's becoming normal that's just anti God at this point. It's amazing. But Yeah. It's a real thing. The mind is the mind is the most in incredible thing to me once you understand how it works it's a, it's an incredible tool that you can use to change your entire life i don't care where it's at if it's relationships if it's finances if it's careers if it's just peace and happiness there's no such thing as happiness no such thing as peace without happiness um how do you get to happy though your mind period mm -hmm. in the story there's a um African spiritual proverb I told you I studied African spirituality, right? There's a proverb that says, um, it's not a person's laziness, stupidity, or lack of initiative that causes the problems in their lives. It's what's deeply rooted in their mind. Whatever, mm -hmm. whatever is rooted in your mind usually is coming from childhood all the way up through the norm normalities of what you've experienced through childhood. Then you come an adult and then you see the same thing again. The roots have been planted. Now you got to go out in life and live this tree. And this tree has to sit in the sun and the, and the rain, winter and fall and all the seasons and try to become what it's supposed to become with these rotten roots. Mm. It's going to be tough. 
That is true. Wow. I'm stumped. <laughs> no words right now. That's true. That's really true. You just I'm I'm still struggling right now trying to heal from that the childhood traumas and trauma and all of that. Even when, when it comes to relationships, trying to heal from that. Because you go into relationships with the same with the trauma if you haven't healed it to go into something else. Be it relation romantic friendships, all of that. So yeah. See, it's not about healing. See, I, I got this thing with the healing concept because everybody wants to be a healer today, right? But what if you're not supposed mm-hmm. to heal? Like, whoever asks that question, like, what if you're not supposed to heal it? Like, you went through that for a reason. Yeah, it made uncomfortable. Yeah, mm-hmm. it may hurt. But why did you go through it is the question. If you look for the solution in it, you will appreciate the experience. You're not trying to heal it because you learned something from it. But if you didn't learn something from it, you want to try to heal it and forget about it. You ain't supposed to. I've never heard anybody say it like that. Yes. I guess for me, it's like, like if you have a wound, it's, you're going to feel the pain. But at some point. It's technically you. You have mm-hmm. the scar mm-hmm. to remember it. But that I guess that's my like my analogy when it comes to it. Like you have you do go through it, you have the the scar, it's gonna be there, but you are allowing yourself to feel that pain and move through it. If mm-hmm. that make, does that make sense mm-hmm. what I just said? I'm like, did he just say the same thing? <laughs> So, but yeah, I, I think that makes sense that we're not necessarily supposed to heal from it. We just have, we have to. You learn never will it. heal from it. You never will. Like it's an impossible task. You can't. There's no such thing as I'm healed. You've learned to manage it better. Like you've learned to deal with it better. You've learned to not. It's it's all about the practice because again, whatever makes you angry. I don't know what makes you angry. What ticks you off, right? Whatever makes you angry. When you were younger, it was probably volume 10. But as you began to do the work on you, you probably can come down to six, seven, five, four. But you never get to zero. That means you're never going to get angry at that ever again. That's when you're healed. When you can walk into the room with the person that pissed you off, that hurt you and broke your entire heart, and walk in there and just give them a hug. Hey, how you been? I can kiss. And you can do that. You- I graduate. Who does yeah. that? I get that. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I'm not, I'm not that. So because you moved on, got a new boo, you got a new house, you got a new car, you got zeros in the bank account. You think you healed? No, you're not. You just moved on and you put what you're supposed to get from it in the, in the back burner, but you're supposed to put that in the front burner so you can see why you went through that. All that stuff don't mean nothing. Oh, that sounds so I've, this just made me remember a conversation I had with a friend of mine about forgiveness and how forgiveness is for you mm-hmm. and not the other person. She's like, but you don't forgive. Like you can't, you can be, you can move through it. You can feel it, but you, are you really going to be, like you said, going to the room with the person and be like, let's mm-hmm. be best friends. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. Um, dang, I don't, I have no more questions. <laughs> you just shut me up. <laughs> um, where can we, where can we find you? Where can the audience find your, do you have any, anything? What do you have coming up? Do you have anything coming up soon that we can go ahead and check out or? I mean, I do stuff privately. I do private coachings. I do classes. I have about like, 20 no probably i think it's almost 30 now 30 hours of class work that i do with people that people can uh, subscribe to it's called power of a re university i do that i do couples coaching too um anything related to i call them the five blessings of life health finances uh romance um parenting children and then the overall 
victory is basically finding out what your purpose is. That's the victory to me. Once you figure out that, you can't be defeated. So I have classes on all those areas that kind of falls into every part of their lives. So you can find that at powerofarie.com. But I'm on every social media outlet, on the Instagram and all that stuff too. So it's under. What's your handle? Uh, Instagram is King Jasir five three. Um, the Facebook is Jasir Franklin. Um, you can find me there, or you can go to the the actual name of the business that I run is Ori and E. So that's O R I. E N I, and that's what you'll find that on, on pretty much both handles, Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay, I just thought of a question. So I'm a single mom to a young man. Um, what tips do you have to um, those who are like myself that's ra- raising young boys, or just parents? Period to help them um, help their children navigate adolescence growing and um, not falling into the mentality of the PTHD. Is the father around? No. Okay. Um, Tips for you. Tips for the mama, right? Yeah. Yeah. For myself or like other parents that may be in the similar situation. I would say, um, I would probably say what I wish my mother would have had the intel to do at the time, but I would say get them involved in activities early as possible. Um, Sports is still good. Um, Karate, anything where they can have a male leadership figure. But here's, Mm -hmm. here's the catch you have to be willing to let that person do his job. A lot of parents like to jump in, leave my baby and like the baby, they child. No, you can't do that. That's number one. I would tell women is you got to stop babying this little boy. There's this thing. And again, in the spiritual practice, I do. They say a young man, a little boy is a king until he's five between five to 15. He is a slave. After 15, he goes back to the kingship treatment. And then from five, from 15 to 20, he becomes an adult. Now, the slave don't mean you got shackles on your neck and your wrist. It just means that you're doing what you are told to do. You're not here to to give an opinion because you don't know nothing. If you knew everything, you would be born like a like a chicken and get up out the egg and just start walking, go run and live your life. But we are human beings. You have parents for a reason and we're here to give you what you need and to help you cultivate your purpose. Right? So you have to be willing to not baby him. I don't know how old he is, but not 11. 11. Yeah. He's at that age. So you got like two, three, two, three years before he think he's bigger and better than you. If he haven't got there yet. Um, so right now this is the perfect time to get him in front of somebody that's going to start molding that and not give him a break and, and corner him at every, every chance you want that stuff to come out of him so he can see what it is. And then you can reel him back down mm-hmm. and show him how this is supposed to look, but see baby and him is going to pacify that. And he's, he's never going to know that he's going to get grown and he's going to go through that because an adult is going to put him in that space and he's not going to know what to do. That's dangerous. So sports, okay. I put my son in karate and he hated it, <laughs> but I, I, I didn't want you to fight in the street like I had to. So I put you in karate in something control where you can actually learn discipline in it. And his first match, he hated it. He didn't want to fight. He fought a little girl and got beat up. He didn't want to fight. Right. And then, <laughs> and then okay. we, we kept him going. I kept him going as far as I can keep him going, but he got better at it. And he eventually came out of it, but. You got to put them in that hard spot. If they don't get put in a hard spot, they never know what they're made of. Okay. He's a fan right now, but he wants to do sports and karate. So I was looking into sending him, right? Um, sign him up today. Because I know that that's mm-hmm. something that he needs. And so that's something that I want 
you know, I'm going to have, um, I want to be able to put him in that position. So he but also find out what his gift is. If his, if his gift is music, then fine tone that. He doesn't have to be karate because he can learn lessons from the band. He can learn lessons from his gift. That's his gift. He just got to be put in the gift and he got to, his gift got to be put to the test. Okay. He like he draws too. He's just he likes to sketch. So he's 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 artistic, but then he wants to do sports as well. And I don't want to stop him from doing this. So I'm like, I'll you know, I'll put you in it just to see if it's something that you want to do. Yeah, he's um, eleven. Let's sure. or a lot. Like that's how you yeah. that's how he figures out what he's gonna do. I mean, his musical gift can take him until he he's transitioned. And still be here when he's gone. You know what I mean? That gift never leaves. That's true. Okay. Um, what did I ask him everything I needed to ask? <laughs> I think that's it. Um, thank you so much for thank you for that, actually. That was really helpful. Um, thank you for joining me today on the Leap Before Lip podcast. Hopefully I'll be able to have you back on later. Um, and yeah, thank everybody for listening.